Undeniably, the shape and form of one mech has historically towered over almost every other in the storied events of the Battletech franchise. While the mech in question may not have been the first face of said franchise, it has been the longest. As it strode forth from the pages of Technical Readout 3025 in the aftermath of the lawsuits of the 1990s, taking its place at the center stage of the imagery of Battletech. The mech being referred to here is, of course, the mighty and foreboding Atlas. Unsurprisingly, these central figures, symbols of the setting, or of an era, can be immensely popular, so much so that they can actually get a sequel. It would seem that mechs are not all that different from successful films, or even successful interactive entertainment products like video games. The first mech was a resounding success. Why shouldn't you make an additional one? A follow-up, a sequel, if you will. The first battle mech to get a sequel in the living memory of the game's development was of course the Marauder, as it gained the 100-ton Marauder 2 in the original Wolfstragoon sourcebook. Another example of this would take place in the 2000s, where the Mad Cat 2 would materialize in order to capitalize on the popularity of the Timberwolf. There would be yet more Mad Cats to follow as well, due to the MechWarrior Dark Age clicks game. However, these new concepts weren't the only ones to get notable continuations, because, just like these figureheads, the Atlas would spawn several offshoots. The original Atlas's appearance is almost immortal now, having been the visual anchor which the property has been connected to for so long. However, there have been two major attempts to tackle it further, to refine or change it offering significantly different designs as a result. The Atlas III is the sinister continuation of the King of the Monsters in the Dark Age, a powerful and noteworthy battle mech in its own right. But in this video, we are going to view a mech which is perhaps more beloved, even if its backstory falls into the dreaded realms of revision of the ancient Star League. Because... In this overview, we are going to take a look at the final Atlas of the Star League era, filling the role of a royal configuration. It is the last Atlas of Hegemony Research and Development. The Atlas II. The 28th century, even prior to the horror that was the Amer Civil War and the annihilation of the First Succession War, was an example of humanity descending into a world of rising tensions, mistrust, and barely restrained ambitions. In the twilight of the Star League, in this era where the mightiest unified state in human history was in the midst of its decline, those within its government and military institutions began taking steps not simply to subdue disorder in the periphery of the Empire, but to make moves against the increasingly independent and dangerous partners within the organization. Every one of the Great Houses began to chafe under the domination of the First Lord of the Star League, the Director General of the Terran Hegemony. The hegemony itself was the core of the Star League in every way, and in contrast to the other great houses, a technological and industrial powerhouse. To keep these functioning satraps in line, the SLDF, or the Star League Defense Force, was increasingly bolstered into a greater and greater Goliath absorbing funds from across all of the Star League's provinces to feed this now enormous military structure. Regardless of these swollen budgets, and the endless legions the League possessed, halfway through the 28th century, the writing was on the wall. The other House Lords were on the move, even if they were as of that exact time, 
moving carefully and quietly. Several battle mechs were designed and built to challenge these rising would-be warlords, but one in particular stands out above the others. General Alexander Kerensky, the head of the Defense Forces, had a hand in developing one of the most feared war machines in the history of the Star League as part of this. This would be the assault mech known as the Atlas. It was conceived to be the great monster that would redress the balance between the League and its wayward member states. Weapons such as this are built to put terror into the hearts of their enemies before a battle has even begun. Being fixed with a skull over its head and cockpit, this terrifying monstrosity was, and still is, the very thing of nightmares to come up against. When illuminated by the fire of battle and surrounded by carnage and destruction, few can imagine something more fearsome than an Atlas in its full glory. At 100 tons, the Atlas, for its time, became the king of the monsters. In the original publishing of Technical Readout 3025, it was in fact the only 100 ton machine, and frankly it had few battlefield rivals in the era of the late succession wars. But the passage of time in the real world, and the expansion of the setting, this once unrivaled titan, however, has come to share its domain with many other machines many of which rose to prominence in the final years of the Star League. However, in spite of its terrifying reputation, the Atlas was simply not enough for those that employed it. First introduced in 2755, the Death's Head, as it was called by many who came to face it, was not at the bleeding edge of technological advancement. And while this was more than adequate for the general armies of the SLDF, it wasn't sufficient for its core backbone, the elite royal divisions. These dedicated Terran hegemony formations inside of the SLDF, in other words, those that could be relied on most by the First Lord of the Star League, were outfitted with material capabilities that far outstripped even the incredibly well-supplied regular army. The royal divisions were filled with, for the time, technological marvels and brutal war machines that would shatter even the strongest opposition. Staple machines of the SLDF and Inner Sphere like the Marauder and Warhammer received major upgrades, for example but a huge volume of other mechs did as well. From vehicles like the once undergunned 40-ton Sentinel, to already impressive battle mechs like the brutal 65-ton Crusader. The Atlas itself did not receive a royal configuration, but instead was reconfigured into a full and complete successor design. First walking off the assembly line in 2765, and with the oversight once more of Alexander Kerensky after the successful implementation of the original Tyrant of a Battle Mech, designed to be, functionally, the Royal Atlas. This new, 100-ton monstrosity was the brutal answer the Star League had to any possible rebellion against their rule from the periphery, or from within the Inner Sphere. To look at this new Colossus, is to clearly see its lineage in its core appearance. The familiar skull face exists at the top of the mech, as you would expect from its name, acting once more as a crown for this Lord of War. Just as heavily guarded as the original, few could ever wish to come face to face with Kerensky's updated terror. It was built as the Royal Division's hammer, and one to finally force the House Lords into true submission if they acted against House Cameron or the interests of the Star League. They'd be forced to challenge the new face of fear. This deterrent, this savage beast, was never built in large numbers, and worse, like the SLDF itself, it failed in its mission goal almost immediately. 
It wasn't because the war machine and the immense, almost unstoppable juggernaut of the SLDF weren't impressive or intimidating, but because these safe measures and tools of oppression didn't work against the real threat against the League. Within a year of the Royal Exclusive Atlas's introduction, Director General Richard Cameron, First Lord of the Star League, was shot and killed by his supposed friend and mentor, President Stefan Amaris of the Rimworld's Republic. This would spark a military insurrection against the Terran hegemony. Amaris had infiltrated the hegemony with his own forces by working with Richard Cameron to bolster the defenses of the Terran state, while the lion's share of the SLDF was away. This bloody event even saw more than just the death of Richard Cameron, but also huge swathes of the power structure within the Terran state, as well as the destruction of multiple key facilities, including the production site for the Atlas II on New Earth. What few of these mechs had been produced remained only in the hands of Alexander Kerensky's now isolated defense forces, and they would be tested in the horrors that were unleashed as the Ameris coup turned into the Ameris Civil War. A mighty steel chariot for commanders, and superb mech warriors within the royal divisions, these rare abominations would first be set loose upon the Rimworld's Republic. With the collapse and seizure of those territories, some of their captured factories were put to use, even if for a short time, building more of these brutal machines for commanders inside of the royal divisions, as well as making new replacement parts for existing mechs, before Kerensky and his forces collided with Amaris's new empire, one which had been erected over the now blood-soaked remains of the Terran hegemony. In what followed, in the bloodbath put on display for all the inner sphere to see, the SLDF and its royal divisions would grind the Rimworld's army, now known as the Ameris Empire Armed Forces, an impressively bolstered collection of scum and villainy, into broken steel and burnt bodies, before retaking the cradle of mankind and seeing Ameris punished for his crimes against the state and against the people of the Inner Sphere. This was the first time the Atlas II was truly on stage for all to see in the core worlds of human space, and they gave the performance of a lifetime, because it would not be seen in any meaningful capacity again until the 31st century. But its legacy would live on, and this rare titan would be the armor for some of the most remarkable world-changing and leading figures in the long stretch of humanity's journey amongst the stars. First built in 2765 by Hegemony Research and Development, more specifically the Department Weapons Division, the 100-ton monstrosity known as the Atlas II stands tall amongst the war machines it was designed and built to compete against in the final years of the Star League Defense Forces, prior to the collapse of the League and the beginning of the Succession Wars. In its initial configuration, the Atlas II was intended to embody a basic yet overwhelming force in a military confrontation with less sophisticated enemies, many of whom already struggled to challenge the original Atlas. Its creators achieved this by using very limited advanced and expensive technologies in its core chassis. The result was a relatively simple mech, with a presence on the battlefield that simply cannot be ignored, yet was one which didn't badly deplete the resources of its manufacturer. This is far from the norm with more specialized SLDF-based machines. It should be noted. To start with its core chassis features, the AS7DH's frame is a Foundation Type X internal structure. This uses standard material and thus weighs in at 10 tons. While this is expensive in tonnage compared to more advanced endo-steel internal structures, it gives the Atlas 
more critical spaces to work with in order to equip it with an adequate number of weapon systems. It, of course, has a standard gyro and cockpit, simply because at the time of its construction, other options were not available. After this, the most advanced integrated technology on board for this gargantuan battle mech's main features is its Star League era double heat sink set. With 14 of these on board, this Atlas offshoot can dump 28 points of heat per turn, though this does not make it heat neutral, but it does go a long way towards saving weight and towards giving it options in every round of fire. As far as its onboard electronics are concerned, the Atlas II uses an Armycom Class 5 communications package and an Army Corporation Type 29K targeting and tracking system. Neither of these, however, confer the mech any bonuses. In terms of advanced rules, this brawling brute starts off by having the Battle Fists trait, letting it strike with even more ferocity in close with melee attacks using its arms. Next, it has the very obvious distracting quirk, of course denoting its intimidating and foreboding appearance, as it does share key similarities to the original Death's Head after all. Finally, to denote its place as a dedicated mech for commanding officers and vital persons, it has the command mech trait as well, cementing its role on the battlefield when playing with the advanced rules. The most important attribute of any battle mech in terms of determining its overall tactical role in any conflict is unsurprisingly its movement characteristic. And like the original concept that the Atlas II is based on, its mobility is entirely geared towards this hulking 100-ton monstrosity being a breakthrough or counter-breakthrough assault mech. To explain why this is the case, we have to look at its only means of powering its movement across the battlefield, and that is of course its atomic-powered engine. Driven forwards by its 19-ton 300 Vlar standard fusion power plant, the Atlas II is far from the fastest machine on the battlefield, as it only has a maximum speed of 54 kilometers per hour, or five movement points in the tabletop game. This level of mobility ensures that this bipedal war machine, strategically, when not benefiting from dropship relocation, cannot keep up with battle line formations. On a tactical engagement level, the Atlas II is a lumbering wrecking ball, where its limited speed can hinder its overall performance in other respects, as it is vulnerable to enemy flankers if it is not well supported by nearby friendly forces. It is, however, not so slow that it can be easily overwhelmed in engagements by battle line forces, adding to its functionality when squaring off against most heavy mechs at this time. As a final note, it does benefit from its designers avoiding upgrading its 300 VLR to some form of extra light engine, as Star League era XL engines do make it so if it has a side torso that is lost, the machine which it resides in will be instantly engine killed, and the AS-70H does not suffer from this because it does not have this engine type. Given the near legendary protective qualities attributed to the Atlas during the Succession Wars, it is unsurprising that this royal upgrade would follow in its predecessor's footsteps once more. But unlike the original biped, the Atlas II does leverage several defensive features that the other simply does not have access to. To begin with, the main course. It flips out the original's 19 tons of standard plating in favor of 17 tons of Star Slab II ferrofibrous armor. This yields the Atlas II the same volume of defensive points as the original, which is 304. This makes its steel hide extraordinarily difficult to penetrate, though the design came too early to fully benefit from specialist armor types. Even in later generations of warfare, this level of protection is still impressive, even when factoring in more lethal eras of the setting. There is an additional onboard defensive technology, however, that makes the Atlas II yet more durable, which is its use of case systems for its onboard ammunition. This makes striking the skull-faced wall of contempt's ammunition, though catastrophic for the region it resides in, not as effective as it will not entirely destroy the battle mech. 
as explosions cannot spread outside of the torso of its designation. This means that the Atlas II can survive such a calamity and will either continue fighting, or its pilot can attempt to withdraw the battle mech in order to preserve the machine. Overall, for the late Star League era and ahead, the Atlas II, and by extension its pilot, are very impressively guarded. The ability to survive contact with the enemy may be important, but just as important, if not more so, is the ability to crush them underfoot, and the Atlas II is built up from its predecessor to do just that. The AS-7D Atlas's firepower package is an excellent balance of systems for the technology level it was produced at, but some of its punching power is restricted to very close ranges. The same, broadly, cannot be said for its royal sequel. To start things off with its main ballistic cannon, the Atlas II relocates this system from the right torso to the right arm, and changes the system from a traditional AC-20 autocannon over to a more flexible, lighter, and long-reaching Blankenberg LB-10X autocannon. Two tons of ammunition are on board to feed this beast, giving it 20 rounds of fire though these come initially split between cluster rounds and slug ammunition. In essence, this means it can either use this cannon to critfish and sandblast, or to break armor, depending on the battlefield needs in most engagements. And all of this says nothing of the cannon's superb range either. With it located in the arm instead of the torso, it also means that this system can be used to fire in a greater overall field of view as well, giving the mech more options when dealing with targets. For additional arm-based weaponry, and for reaching out and lighting up targets at extended ranges, two Blankenberg 25 extended range large lasers are fitted into the left arm, meant to punch through armor. These very hot running offensive lenses just might overwhelm the mech's cooling system if used in tandem with too many other systems. 12 heat for 8 damage is definitely not an optimal trade-off, I hate to say. But, the long-range assault doesn't end with its autocannon and lasers, and is enhanced yet furthermore by the addition of a Holly 20 LRM-20 launcher, which it has, I should add, 12 rounds of ammunition for. This right torso mounted missile system adds more cluster damage at range, and gives the Atlas II another tool in the toolbox for weathering opponents down at range. LRMs are some of the best weapons in the entirety of the Battletech universe, and this mountain of a mech has a sufficient number of them. For when things get up front and personal, the final systems on board this Royal Division Wonder is a pair of left torso mounted Raker 5 medium pulse lasers, as well as a Holly 6 SRM launcher. The pulse lasers provide accurate fire, while the SRMs provide shotgun like punches. Between most of its long range systems being able to act at other ranges, barring its LRMs, and also factoring in its effective choices in this space, the Atlas II has a more than respectable reputation for its powerful loadout. When everything comes together, the Atlas II is a fantastic assault mech. It is an indomitable force in almost any campaign, but a wary observer may view a few flaws beneath this beast's thick plating. Its core system features are simple and reliable. Nothing is more important for sustained operations and repairs, making it relatively easy to service and support. Its mobility is no worse than most of its titanic peers, including its ancestor, the original Atlas. This is also to say nothing of its remarkably well-conceived offensive package, which will devastate most of its enemies from the time. But here is where we begin to get to some of its less flattering attributes. The mech's speed may be expected, but if left isolated, the Atlas II, despite its other impressive attributes, can and will be overwhelmed by light and medium assets. The other sticking point is, while it is exceptionally well guarded, it is not well cooled, at least not well enough for its potential damage output. Being overgunned is not inherently a problem, but it does mean that the tremendous attacking power it has to hand 
can't always be brought to bear, especially if the mech is taxed by multiple enemies or is involved in a severe firefight. But even with these issues, it's impossible to say that the Atlas II is anything short of exceptional in its role. When used well, when guided by a veteran commander and a decent mech warrior, this Goliath will stride through its enemies like a lawnmower over grass. Just make sure, if one shows up opposite of you, that you're not going to end up being one of the blades. Nicholas was the savior. Her savior. He knew what had to be done to ensure humanity's survival. Even if at times, his decisions were draconian. Through him were born the clans. And with them, a new Dana. Nicholas gave her a new purpose and entrusted her with so much of value. But he also gave her his own brother, Andery the love of her life. And together, they would save humanity from itself. Beginning with the world of the Pentagon. Thoughts of Khan Dana Kufal, June 2nd, 2821. It is relatively well known that many Atlas pilots stayed behind, in the Inner Sphere, abandoning the Star League Defense Forces after the Ameris Civil War, and they became minor landholders within the Great Houses of the Inner Sphere, as they participated in the chaos and destruction of the First and Second Succession Wars, establishing themselves, as well as their descendants, as part of the lower nobility across the Sphere. But what of the Atlas II and its pilots? All of the Atlas II pilots were from the SLDF Royal Divisions, and held loyalties firmly with their leader, General Alexander Kerensky. When the call for his exodus from the Inner Sphere came, almost every single one of them answered. While a mere handful of these tools of war were left behind in the Inner Sphere, mostly being destroyed in the First Succession War, this meant that the only examples of this mighty battle mech remained in the hands of those who followed the Slayer of Stefan Amaris. What waited for these machines and their pilots in the depth of the periphery was little different from what they left behind, however. Everything began unraveling for those who embarked on the departure from the Inner Sphere. If not for one man, Kerensky's son and heir apparent, Nicholas. Nicholas had experienced a great deal of hardships on Terra, being a part of the resistance against Ameris within the traditional territories of Russia. After seeing the liberation of his world from the tyrant's grasp, by his father no less, Nicholas grew disillusioned with his parent in many ways, as he viewed his idol, a man he ironically barely knew, give up in the face of the remaining house lords and afterwards he saw him organize the SLDF Sudral from the Inner Sphere. Nicholas wanted his father to fight these things, not run from them. But none of his desires came true, at least within the Inner Sphere. It was on the Exodus Road that Nicholas Kerensky's potential began to be realized, but not as a champion of what was right, but as a champion for his twisted worldview. The traumatic upbringing he faced, as well as perhaps a predisposition to antisocial behavior, warped Nicholas into a manipulative creature masquerading as a man. He inserted an agent who then exaggerated problems on board the Prince Eugen, resulting in its mutiny. He would then use the incident to exert a ruthless culling of those who had been pushed into this betrayal sending a message to others. 
This was how ruthless the young Kerensky was. And that happened before he was infected by the curse of Eaton. Alexander's eldest son would barely survive his encounter with the brain fever, and that of course was unfortunate for humanity as a whole. It's noteworthy that his behavior, already displaying signs of a deeply troubled and cold individual prior to his infection, became noticeably worse. After this, his conduct and demeanor indeed deteriorated. But even with him displaying these worrying signs, Nicholas was unironically promoted to the head of the 146 Royal Battle Mech Division, displaying that divine humor in Battletech must be real. With the collapse of the Star League in exile, the splintering of the SLDF, and the deaths of Alexander Kerensky and Aaron de Chavier, it would appear that this new outpost for mankind, this beacon of the Star League, was soon to go out. A ruthless, ideologically motivated man like Nicholas, however, would never allow that to happen. Unity was the name of the chariot which Nicholas Kerensky would find as his mount, and this mech was no less one of the mightiest mechs and symbols of the Star League. An Atlas II. These particular machines were rare, even amongst the Star League in exile, and many ended up in Brian caches, and were treated as prizes for whoever acquired them. Leading his forces into battle against the upstarts and brigands of this collapsing political and social environment, as the head of the 146 Royal Division, Nicholas used his 100-ton war machine with immense skill as a warrior. Separatist militias were crushed when he entered the fray and even treacherous units of the now former SLDF, including the saner Royal Divisions, were no match for Nicholas's tactical genius and his deadly talent as a mech warrior. Every battle he engaged in was to hold on to precious supplies and materials to allow for what he described as the Second Exodus. His successes in these often desperate engagements were remarkable. The most notable battle the son of Alexander had was in the evacuation of Vesta on Eden, where he held the line against a bandit force called the Irkursk Irregulars. He expelled every round of ammunition inside of his battle mech until his autocannons and missile launchers ran entirely dry. In the wake of the carnage that he unleashed, a half dozen battle mechs and tanks were left in flames. At the climax of this battle, he charged his war machine directly into the enemy commander, who piloted a pillager 100-ton assault mech, laying waste to it with pulse lasers and fists alone. Unity, after this, was very much the symbol of the man who would become a living deity, seemingly for his followers. After Nicholas's second departure, the rest is thoroughly understood history, the 146 Royal Division and Nicholas's other followers would arrive on Stranum Necti. He conceived the clans, a ruthless and brutal warrior society, and one which would be driven by eugenics and a narrow concept of honor. His forces would be reformed into 20 clans before being reforged mentally. These forces were then rearmed by the new industries which had been built inside of the Land of Dreams. This army of hardened warriors was then turned towards the Pentagon Worlds. The clans were vicious in their campaign against this collection of badly mauled and disunited worlds, and this allowed for him to enforce his new vision of society onto the survivors. From here, Nicholas guided what were his people down a path he would view as righteous. But most sane people even those in the fractured and burning inner sphere, most certainly would in fact view this as barbarism. And this said nothing of his growing obsession with ensuring that his views would survive him. There was also his preoccupation with unification, as he realized that to have unity and continuity, in essence, his clans needed an enemy. That enemy became Clan Wolverine, which politically fell out of favor with several of its cohorts, and which had attempted light reforms of Nicholas's ideal system. 
This resulted in a vicious spiral that would see Clan Wolverine officially annihilated, though some of its fractured survivors did manage to slip away, heading towards the Inner Sphere. The outcome was, in fact, optimal for Kerensky, who used their supposed treason as a means of intimidating others from straying from the path. Those responsible for much of Wolverine's woes, Clan Widowmaker, found themselves in dire straits after this calamity. The clan in question had become increasingly difficult to manage, and as a solution, Kerensky allowed for Clan Wolf to attempt to absorb this troublemaking clan. As a related aside, some believe that Kerensky's true vision of the clans would be for them to absorb one another until only one remained, creating the true ill clan. In this trial of absorption, Kerensky was destined to oversee it as a referee. To do it, to stand on the field of battle with his clans as they fought for supremacy, Nichols rode into battle on his faithful steed, his Atlas II, Unity. But instead of merely participating as the judge, during a particular tense part of the engagement, when the circle of equals had been broken in a trial of grievance between the cons of Widowmaker and Wolf, Nicholas piloted Unity into the fray in an attempt to bring order to the trial once more. This was to be the last act of the founder of the clans. Con Carl Jorgensen of Widowmaker delivered a killing blow on Unity and on Nicholas Kerensky when he perceived the Ilkhan as an enemy wolf mech entering his combat zone. Nicholas was, after all, painted in wolf colors when this took place. To be more precise, Kahl's large laser landed true, scorching the Ilkhan's cockpit and turning the vicious and uncaring man within into a burnt bag of dehydrated meat, killing him. Unfortunately, as one would understand, this did not go well for Jorgensen or the Widowmakers, who were crushed in short order. With Jorgensen himself being executed by his rival, Condrome Winson of Clan Wolf, the following day. In the aftermath of the end of Kerensky's life, the clans would be changed forever, entering into what they came to call the Golden Century. But in the aftermath, the Atlas II slowly faded from view. These now ancient war machines dwindled in numbers and dwindled in their importance. No Atlas II C came from these monsters, as the very nature of the clan simply didn't encourage them. Instead, they became prizes, icons of war from their distant past in the Inner Sphere. And one of these mechs is the most prized of all. Unity, which had been the first Ilkhan's coffin, stands in the Great Hall of the Clans. A customized configuration of the original Atlas II, using advanced client technologies which have become available during the latter portion of Ilkhan Nicholas Kerensky's life, Unity is a unique, one-of-a-kind battle mech. All the same, its profile is well documented, labeled more specifically Atlas II AS7DH Kerensky, though more recently this mech has been dubbed Unity. While it is impressive in many ways, the most extraordinary thing about the mech is the space-saving technologies it benefits from. When we begin the process of examining the technology specifically used on board, the greatest advantage this mech has is its use of clan double heatsinks. Not only do these take up less space, there is also more of them on board, giving Unity the ability to dump 38 heat every turn. Next, it converts its inner sphere ferrofibrous armor over to clan standard ferrofibrous, letting it take up less critical space once again and providing more protection per ton. An active probe as well as an ECM suite are both installed on board too, giving Nicholas's ride more versatility in both detecting enemies and in its electronic defenses. Being updated to a clan quality chassis too, Unity also benefited from having a default case system installed into it as well. Beyond these vital changes, there is an extensive overhaul of the mech's weaponry, 
To start with, it comes armed with twin clan quality ER large lasers mounted on the left arm, saving weight and increasing their range and damage. Given the mech now runs cooler as well, these lasers are no longer as restrictive as the original variants. Next up, it has an LB-10X autocannon in the right arm with two tons of ammunition once more, letting it punch holes or deliver scatter shots. Its missiles are updated to clan quality, with its LRM-20 losing its minimum range penalties and receiving an Artemis IV fire control system. Likewise, twin SRM-6s with Artemis IV are installed as well, giving it twice as many missiles as the original's close-range loadout. Finally, to cap all of these systems off, Unity has a pair of clan-quality medium-pulse lasers. Overall, Nicholas Kerensky's custom Atlas II was a dangerous and devastating abomination to face on the battlefield. Its destruction at the hands of Khan Jorgensen purely comes from the fact that he blasted the mech's cockpit out in a single strike, rather than facing this powerhouse of a war machine head-on in a real fight. Why does this devil in stone think he knows what's best for my family? Why should I have to choose between never seeing them again and bringing them to a combat zone? I've been here since we drove off the Wobbies in 74, but this rock is still infested. I've spent the last seven years dodging bullets, hunting down gorillas, and being so afraid of traps that it takes me a couple shots of snaps to get some sleep most nights. I lost a huge chunk of my leg in service of the Archon and country, and I've been cast out like a second-class citizen. All I want to do is go back home and live a normal life on Comburg, but Stone's taken that away from me. Sky Press Editorial Unknown Author March 21st, 3081. Much time would pass for humanity before the Atlas II's terrifying visage was seen again. The succession wars in the Inner Sphere raged for centuries, before the violent and vicious clan invasion threatened to overwhelm the Draconis Combine and Federated Commonwealth, an invasion which was only eventually stopped by the combined efforts of the great powers of the Inner Sphere. After this, the Federated Commonwealth would split in a violent civil war, and this would shatter the Second Star League, which had formed in response to the clans. And that would have consequences. The Word of Blake, a series of sects which had broken away from the secularized Comstar, now led by Thomas, the Master, Merrick, saw the territories of mankind deviating away from their interpretation of Blake's prophecies at the collapse of the Second Star League, and did not take it well. Instead of calmly reassessing where their prophecies perhaps had been interpreted incorrectly, they instead launched a massive religious war on the Inner Sphere, using Comstar's ancient hidden assets to bolster their production, as well as using their assets within the Free Worlds League as well. Their assault, at its height, was so successful that this Blakist empire stretched across much of the Inner Sphere, including taking vital worlds such as Hesphorus II. With the capture of Defiance Industries, the Word of Blake would have yet another major manufacturing center at their disposal. With ancient knowledge at their fingertips, and with their own material needs in mind, the Word of Blake went down the path of reorganizing many of Defiance's production lines. And in one instance, they did several runs on the long-lost design of the Atlas II. These machines were used for the worst purposes, 
being a part of the Blakest attempt to dominate the entirety of the Inner Sphere. Only, this would in reality backfire on them in the end. Born in 3043, with little information known about him prior to escaping from a prison camp on Kittery in 3071, a man named Devlin Stone would appear as a key figure in the history of the Inner Sphere. From the moment he broke free from their control, Devlin became the leader of a rebellion against the Blakists. And from the start of that rebellion, he had Phantom at his side. One of the Defiance produced Atlas IIs, and a machine stolen from the Kittery garrison by Devil and Stone. This mech, Phantom, became the symbol for Devil and Stone himself in many respects. Stone would be at the center of the movement that appeared in response to the Blakists' assault. A grand alliance of powers, both Great House and Clan in origin, formed, with Devil and Stone at the head of the coalition, fighting back against the overextended word of Blake. This institution was at the heart of the Inner Sphere in some form since the First Succession War, as the organization had been a part of Comstar, and its fate was to seemingly be snuffed out as they lost ground in theater after theater, even inside of their puppet states like the Free Worlds League. The ultimate downfall of the Word of Blake came after years of intense fighting, and this also spread enormous amounts of death and destruction. Thomas, the Master Merrick, would be killed by nuclear bombardment from the Regulan Fifes. Ironically, being killed by order of the last branch of House Cameron, the former rulers of the Star League and Terran hegemony. However, equally important was the fall of Terra, and the death of Precentor Marshal Cameron St. Jemias, who was killed in a last stand, in a duel no less between himself in his customized awesome, standing against Devil and Stone within his phantom. The trauma of their campaigns was such that even seven decades after their fall, any hint of the Blakist presence is enough to spur states into action, hunting for any remnants of this former central power to the inner sphere. Standing atop the rubble that had been left behind, Devil and Stone, with his Atlas II standing guard, used his leadership role within the coalition, and the immense political power and prestige he had acquired in the aftermath of seemingly the destruction of the Word of Blake, to form a new state at the heart of the Inner Sphere to replace his now vanquished foe. The Republic of the Sphere. Devil and Stone and his Republic oversaw the longest era of generally peaceful conditions the Inner Sphere had seen in centuries, and Stone himself would depart from his role as Head of State in 3130, having made the Inner Sphere a better place, seemingly by being in it, though things are seldom so straightforward. From this point out, all seemed as though it would be well, until of course, the Dark Age began. Perhaps the most iconic battle mech from the Blakest era and even parts of the Dark Age, if for no other reason than being used on the cover of rulebooks and because of its striking paint scheme, the Phantom, in its final configuration, is one of the most intimidating battle mechs to appear during its age, matching the prominence of Nicholas Kerensky's unity in many ways. First things first, it embraces clan technologies for some key systems, in the form of having a Clantech 300XL engine and using 17 clan double heat sinks, letting it cool 34 every turn. It's got an armored cockpit, increasing the survivability of its pilot, who is typically, of course, Devil in Stone, and it has a heavy-duty gyro, making it less likely to be permanently disabled by gyro hits as well. Beyond this, it flips its armor type over to standard in order to save on critical spaces, and ups the tonnage to 19, making it the same as a traditional atlas. It also benefits from Case 2 systems, allowing it to potentially avoid the most catastrophic problems when it comes to ammunition explosions. 
To add to this growing list of defensive features, Devlin's Atlas also comes with an anti-missile system as well. Finally, an Angel ECM is on board, enhancing its protection yet furthermore. All of these changes make Phantom very much a formidable opponent on the battlefield, though its XL engine, even though it is of clan quality, may prove to be a liability as it increases its chance of suffering an engine kill. As far as weaponry is concerned, Phantom retains the LB-10X and traditional medium pulse lasers of the baseline AS-70H. Borrowing from Kerensky's Unity, even if not intentionally, Phantom does a logical thing as well, upgrading its Inner Sphere ER large lasers to clan quality ones, giving it much more threat range, damage, and weight effectiveness in regards to these systems. As a quick aside, it does also notably have 4 tons of LB-10X ammunition, rather than just 2, which is very impressive. The final weapon in this assembly of destruction is an MML-9 launcher with Artemis 4 fire control that can be found mounted in the right torso. It has a combination of SRM and LRM ammunition for the launcher as well, letting it either launch devastating close-range bombardments or long-range harassment fire. Overall, Phantom might not be quite as impressive as Unity, but it is still nonetheless an extremely dangerous and well-regarded machine. Clearly it was designed at keeping itself in the fight as long as possible, and keeping its pilot alive at all costs. It definitely makes sense that this was the machine Devil and Stone rode to victory against the word of Blake. With the word of Blake being seemingly annihilated, and the rise of the Republic of the Sphere, one may ask, what happened to the general design of this Mount of Kings? Its future at this point was actually uncertain. In the aftermath of the cataclysmic war that had so thoroughly degraded the entire inner sphere, even industrial juggernauts like Defiance Industries had to make decisions on what they could afford to build now and the Atlas II was not one of their traditional mech designs. As it had been imposed on them by the now formerly occupying Blakists, despite its performance. Its future at this stage, in other words, was not so certain. The Lyran Commonwealth, the home of Defiance and Hesphorus, was in desperate need of revitalization, and not simply because of recent events, as of this point. Archon Adam Steiner had presided over a realm which, as of the end of the threats in the 31st century, had been through decades of near-constant high-intensity conflicts. First, the Clan Jade Falcon incursion into the realm had been brutal. It had stripped away much of its former border region which it had with Rosselhaig. Operations Bulldog and Serpent, while successful, and while not seeing further loss of Lyran industries or territories, still expelled vital military resources, albeit ones built in response to the clans themselves. After this, Catherine Steiner Davian, or Katrina Steiner II, became Archon, seizing power in the Lyran state, before leading it headlong into the Fedcom Civil War. Huge volumes of war-making materials were expelled, and massive damage was done to the population, infrastructure, and even the state's production capabilities. Now, after all of this, they just suffered through a brutal campaign that was even more destructive, launched by the word of Blake. Decades would need to pass for the state to recover. So, to say the least, House Steiner and its industrial base were in little shape to do much of anything with this new inherited design. However, runs of Atlas IIs were built during this time all the same as the mech had proven itself during the era which Devil and Stone emerged in, though it was still a rarity in comparison to the more traditional mech the two was based on. As years passed on, Defiance would seek to perfect the Atlas in terms of its modern production, by evolving it towards a new peak of inner sphere design, the AS-8S Atlas. In the process of reaching this stage of support, however, it created a large stockpile of Atlas components. 
These leftovers were then combined with existing stockpiles of Atlas II parts, creating the AS7 DKH model for limited runs. However, these proved to be more than popular, which then put a new major configuration of the mech into production permanently for the first time since the Star League itself. These towering juggernauts, along with a wide array of other powerful war machines, did not save the Lyran Commonwealth from descending to the lowest point in its state history, at least since the era of the original Star League. The rule of Adam Steiner represented somewhat of a recovery, but like many other nearby states, from Clan Jade Falcon to the Draconis Combine, there was a sense of lethargy, or stagnation. The era of peace brought about by Devilstone's victory over the Blakus had created grievances and ambitions that could never be addressed. And with time, slowly, those who had been suppressed by the Republic's peace would prepare for what came afterwards. Unfortunately for the Commonwealth, Adam Steiner's successor, Archon Melissa Steiner II, after the HPG blackout, embarked on what could only be described as the greatest folly in the history of the Lyran state. Even the succession wars were in many respects less devastating. This new Archon started the road towards disaster by seeking to annex sways of the former Free Worlds League, particularly its strongest areas regarding industry. And to do this, they partnered with Clan Wolf. Next, during this, after the blackout, they had invested heavily in Comstar, which turned out to be a terrible choice, given the Republic would absorb what was left of the entity after the incident with the Blessed Order. To give you all a quick overview, they invaded the former League, turned on Clan Wolf, and then went bankrupt as their own army was routed before not only the Wolves, but an invasion by Malvina Hazen's Jade Falcons. The state, in essence, collapsed, as the Archon ship became a hot potato, before Melissa Steiner II was killed by the clans just prior to their withdrawal from Tharkad. But during all of this, despite attacks on it, and in spite of the nobles who ruled it playing a very dark role within the state, Hesphorus stood in defiance to all of these events. Even as parts of the rest of House Steiner broke away, this world, the most important hyper-industrial center in the Inner Sphere, second only to Terra, still stands, and still produces legions of battle mechs, tanks, and other war-making materials for the exhausted, but still persisting Leering Commonwealth armed forces. Among the mechs still in this inventory, still fighting against the darkness attempting to swallow the Commonwealth and House Steiner even now, is the Atlas II. Whether it be in the intense fighting in the former Jade Falcon occupation zone, now known as the Hinterlands, or it be the attempts to hold onto its outer territories near its periphery side, or even against its longtime nemesis, the Free Worlds League. The Atlas II now treads where House Steiner tries best to stand firm. It is a question, though, if this hulking figure can hold the line, especially with the country in the severe crisis it's in. Only time will tell. But in this new age, this version of the Death's Head marches very much for its masters. House Steiner, in defiance against the Abyss. The only configuration for mainstream production of the Atlas II since the fall of the original Star League, the AS7DKH, is a far divergence from the original. It does something very few Atlases do, namely moving faster than 54 km per hour. In other words, it makes its mark by being more mobile and leaning into advanced technologies to offset the weight loss it experiences as a result. First manufactured in the Dark Age by Defiance Industries as a true homegrown Atlas II, it has been exported around the Inner Sphere since its introduction in 3139. So let's go over what makes this variant of the Atlas II the unique beast that it is. First things first, it has a 400XL engine, letting it run up to 64 km per hour or 6 movement points in the tabletop game. This means it can move at the rate of battle rather than just at the rate of breakthrough assets. 
It's further bolstered by the fact it has 16.5 tons of ferrofibrous armor, yielding at 295 points of protection. After this, it has a pair of Case 2 systems, letting it potentially survive ammunition explosions. After these features, we can begin to look at offense, and this does have some very real offense. The Steiners, by the time of this mech's development, have the largest number of domestically sourced clan tech level weapon systems out there, and it's reflected quite well in how this monster is built. To start things off, it has a pair of clan tech ER large lasers in the left arm once more. Then, in the left torso, it has a pair of ER medium lasers. After this, it has an SRM-6 installed in the left side too, and a clan quality LRM-20 in the right torso. The SRM launcher has 15 rounds of fire, and the LRM launcher has 12. The final piece of the weaponry on board is its right arm mounted rotary AC-5 autocannon, which has 60 rounds of ammunition. In total, this mech can do real damage, despite its gigantic engine, thanks to mostly being able to lean into clan tech advantages. It's well guarded, well paced, and well armed. What more could you reasonably ask for? The only real weaknesses it has are cost and its XL engine offering it a major vulnerability, should its side torso be put into jeopardy. One of the reasons I opted to make this video covering the Atlas II is related to the fact that it's a part of the 40th anniversary of Battletech in a bigger way than one might expect. Four dedicated Star League miniature packs are being released, and the first one is the Star League Command Lands. Front and center in the box is the Atlas II. When these sets come out, people often want to know more about some of the more storied machines within them. And in this instance, I decided to head off that interest at the pass. As you can see on screen now, I have a copy of this box, which was provided to me by Catalyst Game Labs. CGL didn't ask me to make this video, nor was I paid to do it in any way, just to be clear, though the box again was provided by them to me. I actually felt like I needed to do something with it, just after I received it. I didn't even really know it was coming until like a day before it did. So outside of that obscure channel lore, what of the pack you see before you? First of all, it has an excellent sculpt of the Atlas II within it. Anthony Scroggins redesigned this brutal machine, a design, if I'm not mistaken, originally put together by Ray Arastia, the current line developer for Battletech. The mech looks mean and ready to go, with a sharp looking pose. After this, the most exciting thing within this is definitely, at least in my opinion, the Thunderhawk the ultimate clan-busting monster from TRO-3058, and one almost impossible to match with Intersphere technologies for a century in-universe. Why? Because it has three Gauss rifles. It's an absolute walking nightmare. The sculpt itself is a fantastic update over the original TRO-3058 design, and was once more done by Anthony Scroggins. After this, there is a new variant of the Phoenix Hawk. We've seen Phoenix Hawks before, but it's nice to get a new variant. Remember, however, Battletech is not what you see is what you get. Any Phoenix Hawk can represent any configuration in the rules. Finally, it's got a painted Orion. I'm not big on the concept of pre-painted miniatures myself, though the quality of the paint job on the miniature is better than I originally anticipated. Though that's not fundamentally the issue I have with pre-painted mechs. Still, for most people, this doesn't really factor in. I believe this version of the Orion is meant to be Alexander Kerensky's. There are a host of pilot cards within as well, as demonstrated here too. So there you all go, a sneak peek at the upcoming Star League Command Lands, which is meant to be released really, really soon, where the Atlas II is making its debut in plastic. The real question I've been wondering though is how many people are going to try to paint this thing up like it's the Phantom? There's something genuinely remarkable about the Atlas II, and it's not its brutal weapons configuration, or its morale-crushing appearance. That is namely, 
It is a machine meant to be a refinement of one of the most iconic battle mechs of all time. And it is a machine piloted by some of the most remarkable mech warriors to have ever lived. But it is also hardly known in comparison to the mech it was meant to be an improvement upon. Hindered by the time of its manufacturing, impaired by limited production runs after the fact, and further disrupted by the original Atlas chassis evolving over time into formidable and frightening configurations like the AS-8S, AS-8K, and AS-7C series of production runs, often it feels like the Atlas II, the sequel mech, is crowded out by the original, more famous Atlas. At the end of the day, its weaponry and equipment don't outpace many of these devastating updates. But to only see it from this perspective is not a fair way to tell its story, because the Atlas II is at its core, its pilots. It is the face of not only the father of the clans, as Unity was the mount for Nicholas Kerensky, it is also the face of defiance against the word of Blake's era of Battletech, in the form of Phantom being used by Devil and Stone to bring down the organization, which threatened the entirety of the Inner Sphere. Yes, the Atlas II is not the Atlas, not truly, and it won't be, but it is, at this point, its own monster. And almost more importantly, its role has been reserved to be the machine for great men who would change the world. It is not the king of the monsters, as its predecessor was. It is the chariot of the gods. The whole thing happened so fast. In the middle of the refusal over Jerome's call for Clan Wolf to absorb Clan Widowmaker, Widowmaker Khan Carl Jorgensen had challenged Jerome to a trial of grievance. Jerome was the better warrior, so he had Jorgensen on the ropes in short order. BPC strikes tore through the hip of Jorgensen's Highlander, inflicting the mech with a devastating limp Jerome planned to exploit to the fullest. That moment, a star of Jorgensen's Widowmakers violated the circle of equals. And then everything unraveled into single frames. Nicholas's mech moving in front of him. The bright flash of the Highlander's laser discharge. The Atlas II going limp. Falling backwards. Slowly. A giant losing its inevitable war with gravity. The silence. Dear God, the silence. Perspective of Con Jerome Winson, 7th of October, 2834 on Ironhold, recounting the death of the father of the clans. Thank you all for joining me here today. Well, that took forever to get done. I'm really sorry to everyone for the delay for this particular video. Not only did making the Warhammer 2C take a huge amount of time and energy, but I also ran into the issue of working on two other videos, and then pivoting between projects at various times. I then ended up traveling to KerenskyCon and Adepticon, which were genuinely amazing events to have gone to. It really helped reframe my approach to the setting, and I can say it was one of the best experiences I've had in years. But it also ate up several weeks worth of time, and made my writing of the script even more of a mess, as I was working from my laptop remotely for a while. Then, I got back to Canada and got super sick, likely from the final plane flight home, where there were a number of sick people on the plane. But I finally managed to finish the script, and then I got to recording even with my voice in this condition, and I pieced this all together. 
I really opted to do this video as a whole because of the Star League Command Lance, if only because I thought the video would be topical. Oh, speaking of which, there will be a post on the channel Discord, showing that I donated the approximate value of this box set to the local BCSPCA. As some are aware, when I do product reviews like this that I haven't paid for, and it goes into a review like this, I always tend to donate to charity the value of the box, barring extreme examples or very specific circumstances. Before I forget, it would be negligent of me to not mention it, but it looks like the Star League Command Lance should be out, like, really soon. So if you are excited by the idea of getting a Plastic Atlas 2, they will be available to you soon enough. So, there is the wild journey of how we got the Atlas 2 video. If you enjoyed that video, have you considered smashing the like button? I hate that term, but I've heard it helps. If you're new here, don't forget to subscribe too. I've got more fun things coming, I promise. Finally, a huge thank you to all the YouTube channel members, because these videos are genuinely only possible because of viewers like you. And with that, what did you all think of the Atlas 2? Let me know in the comments section below, and I will catch you all there. And also, speaking of the comments, in the top pin comment, as per usual, you will find links and resources to the various things that I used to make this video.